And today I'd like to present my findings on common onomatopoeia in Ihansu. Uh, so um, I tried to focus on common cross-linguistic onomatopoeia to try and create a broad overview. In order to do that, I had about four sessions of 30 minutes, uh, thought sessions of about 30 minutes of elicitations with our language consultant. Um, and I chose onomatopoeia because they're present in every language and they tell us something not just about the language, but also about the culture surrounding it. Um, I have a short list here of the uh, different categories that I tackled in the different sessions. So if you have any questions at the end about the elicitation process, um, I'd refer back to this. Okay. Starting right away, um, I first focused on animals, and I have to say I mainly got lexicalized items. So there were very few, almost non onomatopoeic bare elements. The special case that I was able to get was for new, so for the cat, where you have so purring sound. Um, other than that, I was able to divide my data into items. Um, that are individualized depending on the animal and then where you would use ikulila to refer to an animal crying out so no specialized vocabulary um, ikulila as you can see is used for cat leopard goat sheep and insects such as a bee a mosquito i'm sure there's more but these are the ones that i uh, focused on during my elicitation um, you can see that cat and leopard are put into italics, and I will get back to that in a second, because I'd first like to continue looking at the individualized items. Um, and as you can see, I've highlighted some aspects that I would like to talk about that I would like to focus on for today. You'll also find the same process on um, other slides. I'm sure there's more to get out of these, uh, definitely, but this, these are the ones um, that I would like to stress for today. Um, and for the lion and the cow, we have the items ikiluza and ikikuza. And what we can see here is that we have this stretched vowel um, similar as we have it in English, for example, for lion roar or for cow moo. Um, we have that merit in Ihansu as well. And then we have the snake, where we'd say the snake um, hissed, it would be nzoka ikuzizima. So we have a fricative here. And also very interesting, um, not only do we have the fricative in in, in the noun and the verb, but we also have the additional verb ikuzizima, um, which refers to the the sound a human person makes when being stung by a scorpion. So very interesting that we have the this connection here. Ikukota for elephant, ikugila for the barking dog, um, and then we have inkuku ikukunkula for the rooster. Um, and once again, we have, I, I've marked this Vila consonant because this actually appears in many, many languages. We have it in English, we have it in German, in French, in Hebrew, in Japanese. Um, so once again, a parallel. And then Ikumolia for donkey, also interesting because Nico was able to give me two nouns um, for the sound of animals. And one would be Kumola, so the cry for donkey close relation here um, and a very specific one Tuluma which is the growling of a dog right before it bites. Um, since I don't know much about animal husbandry in Tanzania uh, my thought was that I could imagine these um, individualized items might be related to the human animal contact um, looking at lion and elephants so animals that are very common in Tanzania and also typical farm animals like rooster cow um, and the other thought that occurred was looking at or having this comparison between the lion so the roaring lion um, and the leopard for which we'd use ikulila or also the cat um, we have two or we have three different types of cats two cats of prey um, and this might be related to size and therefore pitch of the animals. Um, because if we look at these, all of these animals are relatively small and have a relatively high voice. And especially if we compare leopard 
um, which is known to make high whining nos noises. And of course, the lion, um, we have a stark difference there. Moving on, I took a closer look at lexicalized items. So I was interested in onomatopoeic lexicalized items such as to knock, to whisper, to clap, to slap, to drop, to yawn, and to strike, which with modern technology um, can also mean to click. And here we have several things that I would like to point out. Um, first of all, I marked once again parallels to English. So we have go and knock. Um, we have hui puel in whisper. Um, we have kukuan koi. Um, we have this repeated uh, once again be a consonant reminiscent of clapping. We have bad to slap. Um, we says a special case also. At this point, I'd like to note I marked the co prefix in gray because this is an infinitive marker. Um, the same goes for A because that is the final vowel that is quite common in um, in verbs in Hansu and has to do with mood. Um, so what we're left with are the parts written in black. Um, which are close to the root and kukwisa is a special case because once again this is is a verbal extension so we're left with gua and it does not translate to to drop that is not the literal translation but instead we have something like to cause something to fall right so we have we'd be left with gua to fall um kukwan gua hu to yawn gua hu yawn um and the most important one for today, kukua to strike. We are left with this ku sound. Um, and this is interesting because marked in color here um, are all of the verbs that don't have the literal translation of to knock or to clap, but all of these are actually formed using a construction. Uh, so it would be to strike a knock, to strike a clap, to strike a slap, to strike a yawn. Um, and of course, the 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 root of this um, occurrence to some to, to strike. Um, in the beginning, when I didn't know anything about any sort of spelling um, and just anything about the language, I'm just trying to collect these items. I thought, oh, great. If this means to strike, maybe this is something to do with impact. Maybe this is something... Um, that I can work on. Uh, however, and credit where credit is due, one of my peers, Stephen, was able to tell me that this is a phenomenon that's also present in Swahili. Uh, so kukua, um, this construction using hitting, striking, um, is is actually common in another Bantu language, maybe even in more Bantu languages. I don't know any Bantu languages. Um, and it is in, in these constructions, hitting is used as a sort of auxiliary verb. And when I asked Nico for further examples using these, um, I got um, striking a whistle, striking a kick, striking an instrument, a playing instrument. Um, however, what was or what I did notice was, of course, um, typically you have this distinction still, you have a verb and you have a noun. Um, but for these items uh, that that we would associate with onomatopoeia, um, this does not seem to be the case anymore. So um, that does raise the question of maybe the imitative sound in these lexicalized verbs might actually come from bare onomatopoeia. Then bare onomatopoeia that I actually was able to get were found in the area of collision. Uh, so if two things, two bodies, two uh, entities are colliding, we'd either use kukumula or kikumula, depending on whether both are moving or one is standing still. One is moving at the point of collision. Um, and then we can see kuma, so they collided, and add a bare onomatopoeia for the impact sound. It is important to notice um, that this only works if the two bodies that collide are made of the same material or texture. So I could not say, oh, I'm, I'm slapping something, I'm slapping the table, or I'm slapping my leg, and then use these onomatopoeia. That would not work. It would have to be two similar bodies. Um, and for people, this onomatopoeia would be gu for metal, ch. 
soft things do not have that one. Um, bags of liquid would be boo, plastic would be poo poo poo, and glass giddy giddy. And these two are even more interesting because they show us that these sounds don't just mirror the texture, but also the movement of the material of the bodies colliding. Then very simple, but very nice human noises that I was able to elicitate or observe. Very common sh for hushing someone, ah, a, eh, when someone's thinking. If someone is in pain, they might cry out sh or a, eh, o oh, for relief, e, who, when someone gets surprised. Um, and then we have the special case of when someone messed up, they might make the sound e and then tag on nahutia or nakuhutia, which means as much as I've missed. Then a few more elicitations that did not fit into any of these categories that I've previously presented. Um, he knocked the door, he knocked on the door would be go, go, go. He knocked the stones would be ko, ko, ko. So we have this, this, these imitation sounds again. Um, if I want to say the rain has thundered or the rain thundered, so we have very strong rain, we'd have mbula. And then depending on the tense, eko gumele or eku guguma. So once again, the velar consonant. Um, in comparison to that, one raindrop would be itonio or several raindrops would be matonio. If I wanted to say I'm cracking my knuckles, I would use kokoniola ka. So here we have another bear on the matapia, ka, for cracking the knuckles. And two more nouns, um, chiyogo, which is what you'd call a loud noise, or okatoki, which would be the sound of a gun going off. I'd also like to point out two fate elicitations. Uh, blah, blah, blah does not have a counterpart in Ihansu. Instead, you'd say okotambo lutongo, so he speaks nonsense. Um, and it is also interesting to note that the clock, so as we have an English TikTok, that sound has not been conventionalized. That might be because the clock has not been around in Tanzania for as long as ha has been in Europe. And nowadays people tend to get smartphones where you don't have a ticking noise. Um, so that might be why this has not been conventionalized and why everyone would make a different noise. Okay, so summing up. Um, there were a few bare onomatopoeia that I was actually able to get from my elicitation sessions. Uh, the main ones were for bodies colliding, for collision or human sounds and noises. Um, there, there is the question if maybe these onomatopoeic elements acquired verbal morphology over time. Um, of course, it would be interesting to have a closer look into this hitting, striking construction, preferably someone who knows more about Bantu languages um, and can can compare Ihansu to maybe other constructions found in other languages. Um, and then, of course, it would be interesting to see if these individualized items for animals uh, might really be dependent on human and animal contact. Um, or if maybe pitch does come into play. Okay, with that, all I can say is Sangeli. Thank you all for listening, and please feel free to share uh, to share your thoughts or comments on the topic. The floor is yours. And uh, Songela Nwewe, Amber, I appreciate uh, your contribution here on a really uh, interesting topic that we don't uh, hear that much. We have. You know, we have 10 minutes or so uh, for questions, maybe a little bit longer. Why don't I start us off? I'm really fascinated on some of the stuff that you've come up for for words of contact. We get a lot of goos, and I think we have coos somewhere there as well. And it makes me wonder. So we have this word in Ihanzu for to hit or to strike, which is kokoa. And it makes me wonder, is is does koa this this very common word that we see in Ihanzu, does is that possibly an onomatopoeia that acquired verbal morphology as well? What do you think about that? Yes, that's actually something that uh, the, that um, I noticed as well, and that piqued my interest. Uh, so if you look um, at all of these these elements now, if my laptop would cooperate, thank you. Um, it, it's not just simply this this coup from hitting striking but if you look at the individualized animal uh, animal 
items, for an example, um, these do have elements that would suggest that maybe there once was a bear on a peak form um, that evolved and took on verbal morphology. So if that is the case, I think it is quite likely that that uh, Kokuwa is one of uh, one of uh, is a perfect example for this taking place, um, and especially since it seems to be involved in the formation of other verbs and other lexical items in this category. So I could very well imagine that that is it is quite likely that there is a connection there. Very cool. Thank you. Um, uh, if we do have any other uh, questions, uh, do feel free to uh, raise your hand in uh, which you can access uh, via the reactions uh, button down in the bottom of the uh, screen here. You can raise your hand or you can, uh, uh, and I'll unmute you, uh, or uh, you can put a question in the uh, chat module as well, and I can read out your question. Yes, uh, Stanislav. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Amber, for your presentation. Because I remember I had such data in my texts in songs. So I collected fairy tales, like folk tales. And in those songs where animals and birds were involved, they were singing, like the narrator were, were, was singing uh, with onomatopoeic expressions. So I'm sure you can uh, you can expand expand that list of animals and birds, because I'm sure there are many expressions still to discover. And you know, I have a question: whether the form of the onomatopoeic expression correlates somehow, or maybe reflects the verb that is used for this expression. Because, like in Swahili, we have a different uh, class of words that. Um, that are used as adverbial with uh, with verbs, and sometimes um, sometimes uh, they reflect the phonetic shape of the verb, like to sleep deeply in Swahili would be pofofo, and it reminds of death. This f comes from the expression for death, fa kufa. To sleep like a dead body, to sleep like someone is dead. That's why they use this for folk for. So one of the you know one of the keys to open this mystery might be to look at the phonetical shape of the verb that is used together with this onomatopoeic expression. Yes, thank you for your comment. I absolutely agree. Um, and I definitely agree that there's much more to discover, especially uh, when it comes to onomatopoeic elements. Um, I, I mean, as as I've pointed out, I only had about two hours that I was able to talk to Nico, um, and maybe I wasn't asking the right questions. I'm definitely sure there's more to discover, and I think it would be very interesting um, to compare the phonetic shapes um, to onomatopoeic elements, definitely. And uh, of course, uh, Stanislav has been so kind to uh, archive a large portion of these stories and songs that he's collected also with the Ihonzu uh, archival uh, collection uh, at Ilar. Uh, so uh, that's something that if we were ever interested, we could uh, have easy access to. I appreciate that um, feedback, um, Stanislav, about uh, the fact that songs and stories might be a rich uh, ground for this. So Amber, maybe uh, maybe some uh, maybe a hint for 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 some next steps in uh, in our research on Ihonzu onomatopoeia. Lutz, you've had your hand up. Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, thank, thank you. I think I think I have now. Um, oh, thank, thank you very much, Amber. I think this was a really, an, an, a really interesting, exciting presentation. And uh, you know, I'm I'm amazed how much how much you know how, how much data and how much insight you got got out of you know. But sounds like a very short period of working with the language. So that's really nice. And the other thing I think Andrew just said, you know, for next steps, I think there's so much in there which you could easily develop, or you know, you or someone else really. To, to take it further. Um, so I, you know, I have a number of smaller questions maybe, but one, one thing maybe I was wondering, it's more like a, you know, theoretical or methodological terminology question really. Um, and that is for some of the examples you, you presented, I was thinking of a notion of idiophone, which in, in some languages people use. And I think 
So in the Japanese tradition, they they talk more about onomatopoeia, less about idiophones. But but in you know in other traditions, I think the Africanist tradition talks more about idiophones. And in a sense, so I think I think your analysis is useful because it's more on functional semantic grounds. But looking at idiophones as a morphosyntactic category would give you another angle, maybe to group group data together. Is you know have you come across that, or was it by by you know by choice not to use the term? Were you uncomfortable with it? Or, or do you think it would be a useful term to employ? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, actually, when we started this project, I was um, thinking of working on idiophones. Um, but Andrew pointed out that since that idiophones mostly occur or best occur in natural speech, it would be very difficult to get solid data on that. Um, so I thought I'd go back a step take it a bit easier and um, have a look at onomatopoeia appear first. Um, so definitely, especially when when uh, talking about collision, we're still on the slide. Um, uh, I think that this holds potential for idiophones since we've also got the texture, we've got the movement. Um, so I definitely think there's there, there's more to gain by looking into idiophones as well. Um, but yes, I, I did um, choose to focus on onomatopoeia. appear. But yeah, I, th I think it would be interesting to explore it a bit further because you have, you know, you have such rich data at the moment, and um, to go a little bit further in that direction might might be interesting. But yeah, it makes perfect sense to to step back to start with. I agree. Um, Stephen, I see your hand up. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, I was just wondering whether you, in, uh, you know, listening back to the recordings, um, noticed any particular way in which the intonation and kind of so yeah like the the pros prosodic factors in the way that the or differences in the way that these kind of uh, onomatopoeias are used so are these ones that you've got on screen here used differently to other ones that you came across so used differently in comparison to what exactly well so from you know uh do, do, are they say intonationally uh, separate from the sentence, do they have a particular kind of intonation contour, and you know things like that? And are they are these ones that you know for collision? Are they do they behave differently from say the ones where you're just either crying out or imitating animals and so on, things like that? Yeah, I see. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I have to say that I, uh, I actually did not elicitate full sentences or or uh, different sentences using these elements. Um, but I really did focus on um, on bear, or I tried, originally tried to focus on bear onomatopoeia. So I was looking for sounds that didn't quite work as well as I had hoped it would, um, which is why I ended up with many lexicalized items. Um, but yeah, I, I did not put these into sentences. I did not ask for proper sentences. That is something that would definitely be interesting to to have picked up for further research, yeah. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. For, uh, yes, uh, Jutta. Yeah, thank you so much. I was just wondering, so, I don't, I mean, this is a completely different medium, but, but it might be interesting uh, to look at this. So in comics, you always get these kind of and, and all sorts of noises. Um, so I was just wondering, have you, would that be some like some of your interest as well? Do you think you know that could be some method as well? You know, have people filling in these kind of noises? Do you think that would be a good idea? That would definitely be of interest. Um, I I do have to say, like when I first started gathering um, onomatopoeia that I wanted to look at, I also had a look at these sort of things. For an example, I had bang um, which would be the sound of a gun um, gun but since it was so difficult to get bare on a matapia um, I'm I slightly moved away from that um, and as to the question as to if it would be helpful to have people fill in something like comic stripes I don't know how popular that sort of medium is in Tanzania um, to be honest so I, I think I, it, it sort of depends if that was something that was common and that people enjoyed then I could imagine that it would be interesting definitely um but the question remains if that is something that would be helpful or maybe if there would be a different medium um going into the same direction that might offer 
similar results. I appreciate the the comments about sort of the cultural um, uh, sort of the cultural currency of the uh, of the comic uh, strip. I know recently that there was a paper. Uh, I think it was Alexander Anderson came out with a paper uh, on uh, idiophones in Zulu, and I believe that. Uh, his sort of main source of information was this uh, collection of Zulu uh, comic uh, strips that had been going for several years. So it was sort of an idiophonic archive for him to dive into. Uh, so certainly it's been done on the African continent before. I know that in Tanzania, there are probably very short common, uh, comics that are done uh, in like weekly newspapers, for example, that might involve um uh, idiophones, certainly nothing written in Ihanzu, but um, you probably get stuff in Swahili that people would be familiar with. Very cool idea. I think I cut you off, Yuta. Um, uh, go ahead. Just wanted to say thank you. Well, I see that we don't have any further hands raised or questions in the chat right now. Um, so uh, all that remains is to thank our uh, speaker, and uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Amber, for uh, your talk and all of your work.